Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'll be quick. So to save some of the minutes. So I'm going to present um, in this brief talk um, the way of uh, SSDs can bring benefit to the applications. And uh, I will start with some conventional ways in which SSDs can accelerate applications and then I will move and I will end up with some more sophisticated solutions that can overcome some of the limitations that we are seeing with the more sophisticated, more modern uh, architectures, which is the uh, bus perfect technology developed at DDN, which is IME, the Infinite Memory Engine. <clears throat> oh, if I have to draw uh, a very simple and common um, data flow, I would put on the left hand side the parallel file system, which is a scratch file system typically accessed by many nodes at the same time and it needs to be fast. And then on the right hand side some longer term retention area which can be some archival space of any sort. But what is common all throughout this uh, line is the way the data is managed. Um, basically, most, if not all, these area are uh, managed through uh, a standard which has been designed in the 80s, which is the POSIX interface, when there was no need of such uh, uh, heavy parallelism and uh, uh, simultaneous access from different threads, which is the case uh, nowadays. So we will see during this talk how not only the hardware but also the data management is relevant to overcome some of the limitations that we have on the applications and mainly on applications that are really scalable. So we will show, uh, I will show the um, uh, interaction between SSDs and uh, a uh, conventional file system like Luster, uh, most of the things I will mention about Luster are easily transferable to GPFS. I don't know, saying about uh, BGFS, but uh, we will know it soon. And um, uh, then we will, uh, I will mention something that is coming up in the last uh, uh, five years, uh, three years maybe. So we are seeing that uh, uh, some common needs in the HPC are being transferred in different markets. One of the emerging one is the financial service market and the real-time data analytics. And we are seeing that uh, uh, flash technology can bring a lot of benefit there. Maybe we cannot bring all the software stack from HPC in those environments. So for example, parallel file system are not probably needed in those contexts, but certainly the hardware technology is, uh, is important. And finally, the bus buffer technology, which is uh, something uh, I, will, I will cover later on. So one of the problem when I consider to add some uh, advanced technology like SSD is that application and users don't want to be bothered <coughs> to move data from the fast tier to the slow tier or the way back. They just want to use in the seamless way possible this uh, opportunity, but they don't want to know too much. And the other thing they don't want to know, and probably the system administrator doesn't want to, to have, is that the user decides which data stays on the SSDs. This is not a very efficient way to deal with this very precious uh, resource, because of course uh, all users would like to have their data sitting on the fastest layer. But you have to kind of prioritize users depending on some uh, algorithm, on some uh, concept. Uh, the idea of just getting a bunch of spinning drives and put as many as it takes to get the megabytes per second that you need or the IOPS that you need, it's not viable either because uh, if the euro per megabyte per second is still um, higher on the SSDs, if you 
if you take the euro per IOPS on the SSD is lower. So if you uh, take this approach, it's not only that you, call, that, that you spend in uh, management and in space and in power, but you, only, uh, you also uh, spend uh, at, a, at a purchase time. So um, all the DDN products, I would say all the DDN products can of course host some SSDs, but this is the common brick for all the technologies we will see that is the most advanced that, uh, that we have nowadays. So it's uh, a four rack unit enclosure which uh, hosts two controllers and uh, it's based on a proprietary design by DDN. It means that the motherboard has been specifically built based on our design and one of the peculiarity that uh, this motherboard has is that it has two uh, distinct uh, fully functional um, uh, PCI Express fabric that allows the CPUs to communicate with full bandwidth with uh, the front-end cards, which can be InfiniBand or any, any kind of connection you can think of, and to the back-end drives uh, connected through SAS uh, 12 gigabit. Another uh, peculiarity of this, um, of this uh, system is that internally it can host up to 72 drives, SAS drives, or 48 NVMe drives. Now, thanks to the two PCI Express fabrics, we can get um, the full bandwidth uh, available towards these uh, NVMe drives. And uh, uh, by the end of the year, maybe even earlier, we are targeting uh, to, to use uh, six terabytes NVMe drives. So this, uh, this will be a pretty, pretty dense solution in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, petabyte uh, per, per terabyte per unit. So these are basically the three uh, solutions that you can uh, deploy with SSDs and uh, the conventional file system. So, yeah, <laughs> works. <laughs> so um, you can just uh, use SSDs uh, in place of the conventional spinning drives and this is something that you put on the storage controller and this will be then managed by some sort of AH, HSM uh, policy engine which uh, can be based on Robinhood for Luster and will be based on other things on uh, GPFS. Uh, the SFX is a different uh, kind of uh, approach because the SSDs are within the controller and uh, they, they represent a read-ahead uh, cache. And finally, we have an even more sophisticated read-ahead uh, read cache, which is uh, a storage directly connected to the OSS, which are the um, IO servers in, um, in Luster. So, yes, this is what you can get with uh, 10 of these uh, basic system, uh, so 40 rack unit. Uh, the, this is a number which has been um, uh, demonstrated with um, uh, with Luster. Of course, it's uh, um, it's a throughput, so it's uh, the best way you can think of a, uh, a benchmark. So uh, sequential, uh, um, big I/O, uh, read and write, and. Uh, but the relevant part more than that is, the, is this number. So this 4 million IOPS is pretty, pretty good and something that you are really looking forward when you are spending a lot of money in buying SSDs more than these numbers. Do you have any numbers for metadata? If I have numbers for metadata, I don't. No, not yet. Um, but of course, this approach is not, 
is not a good one when I have an heterogeneous system where not all the applications need SSDs. In this case, it will be a waste of, uh, of money to um, deploy all this capacity with SSDs. So there's uh, um, another approach which is um, uh, mm, which requires you to put some SSDs inside the controller. So you have the OSS, you have your laser file system, you have the OSS, and then you, the OSS receives a, a request for reading a file. Then what happens is that the OSS gets the I.O. served, and then the controller copies the data onto the uh, SFXTL, which is of course made up with um, SSDs. Now, the benefit of this is that uh, whenever you have applications which has a pattern of uh, reread, then you get benefit on the second hit of the reading because you're getting the data from the SFX. And we also are exposing uh, some API in a way that if the application is aware that is going to need a certain file, then the OSS is able to invoke a function to um, manually load the file into this cache. So this is something we can think of like in the prologue of a job. Anytime you need something, for example the input file, you can uh, in the prologue invoke this function so that you have the data uh, when you start the job. And this is, and this is uh, uh, what we see without SFX and this is with SFX. Uh, this is the second read, of course, from the SSDs and as expected, and this is the limitation of the SFX um, uh, the, the SFX product, uh, we don't have any benefit in write because write will, will go anyway towards the, the spinning drive. Now, even this approach is not ideal because the, the point is that anytime you have applications that are rereading small amount of data, but just a couple of times, then you risk to thresh the um, cache uh, represented by SFX and you don't value which is the data that really needs to stay in this cache. Now, one way to, uh, to address this problem is by uh, this, uh, this um, technology, this uh, uh, file heat, as we call it. So anytime you read a file, uh, the OSS internally in its memory is keeping track of this request. So it will increase the counter, the heat of that file. And periodically, uh, any fraction of second, it will reevaluate which data needs to stay on the SSDs based on the heat of the files. So in this way, you, you have uh, ideally the data that you need to have in the SSDs. In the assumption, which cannot of course uh, be always true that the data that you are accessing frequently are most likely the data that you're going to need in the future. That's the assumption of, uh, of these. Uh, there, uh, so there is support also for L advice. It means that if you invoke that function from the application, this will be uh, counted as a, a read operation. So it will contribute to, to, to rise the hit value of the, of the file. Uh, these are some uh, lower level tools that allows you, for example, to enable or disable the counting for the heat, uh, allows you to establish the time frame over which you want to calculate the, uh, the heat. So, for example, anything that has been accessed more than two minutes or two hours ago, you just forget about it. You, you don't you don't consider this. And then you have something which, it call, which is called heat top, which is uh, the top uh, files in terms of heat, so the most accessed files in the latest uh, x seconds or minutes. And of course the, the heat uh, per single file, you can ask. This is, as I said, for the HPC part, 
When you go to, for example, financial services where the, file system, the parallel file system is not required, or when you deal with databases where the parallel file system is not required either, then you need different solutions. One of these solutions is what we call the flash scale, which is basically uh, uh, SSDs within the 14K without any particular file system. So it can be either a local file system like uh, XT34 or RiserFS or um, even draw device. In this way, you can run applications uh, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, real-time uh, analytics like fraud detection or uh, pattern recognition and even, um, uh, even uh, yeah, database for risk assessment and uh, Hadoop, of course, uh, is, uh, is a good match for this uh, kind of uh, architecture. Oh yes, I've already said everything about this. The only thing I want to mention is that, and this is true also for the previous version of the 14K, is that uh, the connections of these uh, systems are both fiber channel, if it's a block system, uh, block storage system, so it can be fiber channel 1632 gigabits, or InfiniBand, FDR, EDR, or Omnipath, or gigabit ethernet. And now we, we, we come to the, to the bus buffering with uh, Infinite Memory Engine. Now, this is, uh, this is pretty common, both on the vendor side and also, in a way, on the customer side, that when we try to characterize uh, a storage infrastructure, we tend to take the shortcut and take the sequential throughput uh, benchmark. So you write gigabytes with many threads, each thread possibly writing in a single directory one file per thread, which is the ideal, uh, the ideal condition because you don't have contention and you don't have uh, read, modify, write penalties because you're writing big blocks. The problem is that we know that when you have a big cluster where many applications are running, even if they are all uh, I mean, separately well behaving, the aggregate behavior will not look as, as good. So the point is that we have to uh, design something which is good for the bad I.O., which is typically the random I.O., small sized, where we have a lot of contention in a single directory, metadata contention, and uh, things like that. Um, this is uh, an interesting experiment that we did uh, in DDN. These are, um, these are, no, anyway. Uh, these are threads writing to the same file. And this is time, and this is the offset within the file. So e these, are, uh, these were um, started with uh, uh, a little delay between uh, one between the others, and this has been renormalized in a way, this uh, time frame. And then you see that, okay, the first thread starts, and this slope is the, basically the bandwidth, but then you can see that these arrows represent the contention. So when a thread tries to access a particular region of the file, it, it receives a, a weight because there's another thread doing the same thing, so it sits there waiting for the lock to be released, and then eventually he start doing the I.O. again. Now, on IME, we are relaxing this constraint because we feel that it's a bit too much, and we cannot afford this anymore on big systems. And so, by relaxing this POSIX constraint, we are getting the ideal behavior, which is where all all the threads are, of course, uh, doing the same, uh, uh, with the same bandwidth are writing to the file. Of course, this is something you have to take into account because if your application is relying on this constraint from POSIX, you have to be aware that something different might, might happen. So this is the basic idea of IME. So you have compute nodes, you have compute nodes, and these compute nodes 
will issue a right request towards the NVM uh, tier, which is, uh, which is the IME. Um, those clients will send both the data and the parity to the IME servers, which will write internally to, its, uh, to their uh, SSDs. And then, when certain events are triggered, this data is flushed to the parallel file system. Now, one of the uh, uh, changes uh, that we made in the design compared to other solutions is that the parity is decided on the client side and is calculated on the client side. The idea is that typically you have many, many more clients and compute power on the client side rather than on, on the storage side. So it, it makes sense. The other idea is that if you think that your data is not worth the calculation of the parity, you can even decide not to calculate any parity at all and just send the raw uh, data. That's the case, for example, when you, when you think that just recalculating the data in case you lose it, it's uh, way cheaper than wasting uh, bandwidth to, to send the parity, of course. And uh, this, is, um, this is more in detail what happens in, uh, with the clients and the servers. So the clients, they all send their uh, fragment to the IME servers, and the IME servers, they write it on the internal SSDs. When the SSDs, when the IME servers, they decide to write the data onto the parallel file system, what happens is that this data gets merged onto a single IME server, which is responsible to write the whole bunch of data. The idea for this is that even if clients are writing in small I.O., and this can be sustained by IME servers, then IME servers are going to write towards the parallel file system in a more friendly way, meaning that it will go like uh, one megabyte I.O. size towards the parallel file system. Uh, the other idea is that we are not using any concept of metadata in the sense that the placement of this data on the IME server is based on a distributed hash table, which means that we don't have the concept of metadata server. We don't have to ask a database or any centralized point of information where this block has been stored. This is basically in the object identifier of the fragment, which is the equivalent of, of the inode. With only that information, you are able to identify where the block has been stored. So, so you mentioned the size of the block and, and also about the metadata. What about the random and sequential? Do you, do, do you write from the IME, the parallel file system, the same way as just on the application, or you organize that? No, no, I, no, no, yes, I reorganize. Even because, so say that, for example, you are writing onto a, a file in a random way. This data gets written on the SSDs. Then wh when they rewrite to a parallel file system, of course, they, they, will, they are going to rewrite in a sequential way. There's no need, of course, to replay the complexities uh, coming from the client. They are making things easier to, to the parallel file system. Uh, these are some tools that have been developed in uh, collaboration with some uh, HPC centers. Uh, this is basically the integration between IME and job scheduling system. So in the prologue of the, uh, in the, prologue of the, um, of the job, you ask the data to be preloaded from the parallel file system into uh, IME. And then at the end of the job, you you delete the data that was temporary files and you don't need any more and you flush the data that you want to be saved and uh, uh, retained after the job ends. And uh, this can be automatically done through some commands in the submission file. Uh, other tools that are of course uh, uh, useful and available are the um, 
tools to control the, um, the usage of, of IME. What I mean is that uh, whenever you reach a certain threshold of usage uh, of IME, you have to make some decisions about what needs to be deleted or what needs to be flushed back. So you have uh, a flush threshold ratio, which means that any time you go above that uh, threshold, you start to flush the data. And the data is... Um, in a very uh, already known way is named as dirty or clean depending if it's not being replicated in the parallel file system or already replicated in the parallel file system. So of course anytime you need to free space you first delete the clean space which is already replicated in the parallel file system and if that's not enough then you start to flush dirty data to the parallel file system. Uh, this is the erasure coding, I already mentioned a bit. These are the, uh, currently the option that you have now. So 3 plus 1, 5 plus 1, 7 plus 1, 8 plus 1, uh, and, and 0, of course, meaning no, uh, no protection at all. If you do choose to uh, have some protection, this will save you against a drive failure and a server failure. As a consequence of the fact that the parity uh, is being shipped by the client, you have a reduction of um, bandwidth from the client to the server. So these are the values on, a, on an FDR link in terms of uh, loss of bandwidth. Another uh, uh, another uh, new idea, and uh, we think uh, very uh, can be appreciated, is the following. So on GPFS or Luster, the idea to go as fast as possible is to use evenly all the uh, components. So if you have four OSSs or if you have four NSD servers, the idea is to load them at the same level, right? No matter their status, you, you want to send the same amount of data. The problem with this approach is that it works as long as all the parts are healthy. But when, a, when a, one of these parts start to misbehave, uh, going slower or having some issues, some retry, then the problem is that, so for example, that all the other healthy uh, parts are being affected by this. So we made this test. We were running some I.O. We were running some I.O. on uh, uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16 IME servers. Um, these lines here are the lines where everything is working. So even if I use um, the standard way as I increase the number of servers, I have the ideal behavior. The problem is that when I have one server which goes at a half of its bandwidth, I will have this behavior. So what I mean is that the difference between the ideal case and the case where I have one server going at a half of its bandwidth is increasing as the number of parts involved increases. The problem is that the more parts I have, the more likely it will be that some of those will be misbehaving. And the other problem is that the higher the number of parts, the greater will be the effect of, ha of having one part going, going bad. Instead, I, what IME is doing is keeping track of the latency in response from IME servers. So if there's one IME server responding slowly, it will receive less data. That means that, and this is the case with the adaptive, as we call it, data placement, the idea is that any time you have one node which goes at the half of its speed, the difference will remain the same, which is the initial one, and it won't be propagated towards the healthy uh, healthy resources. Uh, 
yes, this is, uh, this is a test where we were running um, with um, different IO sizes and it's not relevant the fact that with IME we are doing 40 gigabytes per second and we last 25. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that the line on IME is flat while the line on luster uh, is not and that depends on the on the IO size so this partly depend on the way we are writing to the to the SSDs we are using uh, a log structure file system which is uh, which has this effect and also has the effect to to increase the lifetime of uh, of SSDs uh, very briefly here this is again a comparison of uh, I think it was uh, it was uh, IOR or FIO, I don't remember, no, IOR. It's IOR uh, with MPIO libraries with raster and IME. And with file per process and single shared file. Of course with single shared file, for the problem that we saw before with raster, we have the problem of contention, which we don't have in the case of uh, IME. Very briefly here, this was a test from uh, iCheck in uh, Dublin. They were running a seismic application and they run this, this seismic application with three different data set. And for each data set, they were running on luster, on IME and in memory. The idea was that running in memory was the fastest way to, to, to have the result. And so we have uh, um, uh, the results are being normalized to the last result, which is of course slower. But the interesting thing is that uh, the IME bus buffer results are more close to the results in memory than to the results of, uh, of Luster. Uh, we couldn't test the larger data set in memory because we didn't have enough memory. I will skip this. Uh, this has been an announcement of uh, IME being sold to a joint uh, partnership of two um, uh, of two universities in Japan. So they have uh, a big file system, Luster, and then they have uh, IME. And uh, uh, these uh, these numbers are. Uh, on the paper, they, they've not been measured. Uh, these are uh, what we have from, from the spec, so uh, we'll get back to you with the real numbers once we can put our hands on. Uh, it should be operational by the end of the year, I think. So, uh, I'm done. Just a summary. The idea of this presentation is to give you uh, a sense of how SSDs can accelerate application, either by using them in a standard way, uh, in, a, in an additional tier on uh, Luster or GPFS, and uh, using some policy engine to move data from the fast tier to the slow tier and, and way back and also uh, using some more sophisticated algorithm based on what we call the temperature with the idea being the more one file gets access the, the more likely it will stay in the fast tier but when um, the IO size the, the, the sizes in terms of IO and also the parallelism tends to um, uh, cause uh, some latencies to be too high, then you need something different. You need uh, uh, a bus buffer solution, which is the IME solution. In that case, you are able to resolve the problem of many to one scenario, which is the scenario where many threads are accessing the same, um, the same uh, region, the same data. And then IME is also able to deal the difficult I.O., which means the small random writes towards the burst buffer and then rearrange in a friendly way the writes towards the parallel file system. And finally, with the data placement, the adaptive data placement, it can be a good match for very big systems and ready for the challenges of 
the exascale architectures. Thank you.